we're going to focus in on intracerebral hemorrhage as a admitting diagnosis, but we're going to particularly focus on intracerebral hemorrhage not associated with other any other underlying pathology, such as a vascular malformation, aneurysm, tumor, etc. So, so that entity is often referred to as spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage. Let's take an overview of intracerebral hemorrhage. So it it comprises about 15 percent of the strokes overall. And now it's, it, it appears in the U.S. there's about 750,000 strokes every year. It has just about the highest mortality of any kind of stroke. With At one year, only 40 percent of people are generally uh, surviving and less than a third are, are, are independently functioning. Quite expensive, six billion a year in the U.S. alone. Seventy percent of the cases are associated with arterial hypertension. And of course, there are these other causes, including vascular malformations, rupture of an aneurysm into the brain parenchyma, uh, moyamoya disease, amyloid angiopathy, tumors, and coagulopathy. And there are several key risk factors. So for this case, we just heard about a patient who's elderly and who is on, uh, and who is on treatment for hypertension. So the, the risk for that patient is four times higher than it is for a patient without hypertension. And the risk for spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage is two times higher per decade as you get older. And alcohol abuse is also a risk factor. But hypertension is, is the key significant risk factor. And frankly, it's the management, the broad management of hypertension in this country that's probably re resulted in the progressively dropping rate of stroke in the country, one of the real uh, uh, victories in uh, population-based medical care in our, in our country. So in the U.S., as I say, 10 to 20 percent of the strokes, or about 80,000 patients a year, have an intracerebral hemorrhage. The mortality is high. Now compare that to other diagnoses that get a lot of attention. Primary CNS tumors, really I've seen estimates between 20 and 50,000 a year. Probably depends on whether you include meningiomas. And aneurysms about 30,000 a year. So it is a very important diagnosis that uh, ranks right up there with the other disorders to which we pay much, much attention. Now I gave this, I gave this talk in uh, Beijing last year, so I just thought I'd throw in the, the, the figures for China. So in China, there are almost 2 million strokes a year and uh, somewhere, but somewhere around a half a million intracerebral hemorrhage cases every year. And their, their incidence of intracerebral hemorrhage is a bit higher than it is the, in the U.S. And uh, uh, with regards to demographics, the rate of hemorrhage is about twice, twice to three times as high in African Americans, and it's much higher in Japanese patients than it is in Caucasians. So how, how does bleeding into the brain cause injury to the brain, damage to the brain, compromise of neurological function. Well, it, it, these are the four ways that you see the injury. Tissue is torn and disrupted by the expanding hematoma. That's direct mechanical injury to the uh, brain from the hemorrhage at, that's apparent at the onset. And in, in today's therapeutic world, there's probably little or nothing that can be done about that particular element, just as it, it, there isn't anything we can do right now about brain tissue that is crushed and completely destroyed by trauma. It's the follow-up events that occur once the patient is under our care that we have to think about and attend to if we want to make a difference. One of those is expansion of the hematoma. It's not uncommon to have a patient come in with a small hemorrhage that expands into a much larger hemorrhage. So that extends the damage. We'll talk about how you might approach that, but the obvious ways are to try to reduce further bleeding by maybe lowering their blood pressure, or giving some kind of an agent that improves their ability to clot immediately and stop the ongoing bleeding. Is there an ischemic penumbra around the clot? Does the clot expand, compress the vessels in the surrounding brain tissue, reduce the blood flow, <laughs> reduce blood flow has been measured around hematomas, and cause ischemia? So is there, is there the hemorrhage surrounded by a zone of ischemia that might be amenable to treatment by, by uh, taking the hematoma out and relieving the pressure. And finally, uh, there is uh, a growing interest in this area of blood toxicity. Elements in blood, blood breakdown products, hemoglobin, 
some of the inflammatory uh, agents that are in plasma it seem to extend the injury. Uh, one, Buzz Hoff, who was uh, the chair at Michigan and also at UCSF when I was there as a resident, did a lot of research on this area. He really was a pioneer in this area. And one of the elements he found that extended the injury, it seems, was thrombin, thrombin which is produced whenever blood extravasates and clotting starts. So there are a number of elements that may contribute to what's been called neurohemoinflammation. And you see the manifestation of this is that growing rim of edema, low intensity on the CT scan, uh, or low density on a CT scan and high intensity on a flare image or a T2 image that surrounds the clot. That is the manifestation, a visible imaging manifestation of that extension of the injury. So what are the approaches? Well, first, minimize bleeding progression. Treatment with a procoagulant like Novo7, a, a clotting factor that has been used to correct coagulopathy. And that's been tested. We'll talk about the trials. Blood pressure control. There's always been an, a, a, a tendency to want to lower the blood pressure in hypertensive patients who come in with an intracerebral hemorrhage. And frankly, if they come in and the blood pressure is 160, does that mean they're a hypertensive patient? Not necessarily. What happens with a Cushing response when you have increased intracranial pressure? Your blood pressure rises. So it can be a reaction after the fact to the hemorrhage, or they may have underlying essential hypertension. That's important to understand. But if they have underlying hypertension, you have to uh, manage the blood pressure judiciously, but not lower it so much below their normal range that you compromise cardiac or renal perfusion and cause a problem. So blood pressure lowering has to be done carefully. Reducing the mass effect, possibly to reduce herniation, which can be another uh, uh, form of brain injury, by hematoma removal is something that we'll talk about. And then finally, reducing heme toxicity. To date, there is no pharmacological agent to counteract the toxicity, to provide neuroprotection against this kind of toxicity. Uh, it, the, the mechanisms are being defined and, and, and agents to reverse that are being uh, uh, reviewed. But the way to reduce the heme toxicity is just to get the blood out of there and reduce the burden of blood that is producing the breakdown products. So just, just a brief overview of what we're talking about so you have the right images in mind. This is a, this is a lobar hemorrhage. This is a basal ganglia or putaminal hemorrhage. And these are a variety of hemorrhages here. So putaminal hemorrhage here, thalamic hemorrhage, cerebellar hemorrhage, brainstem hemorrhage, and lobar hemorrhage. Uh, and, and there's a specific entity associated with lobar hemorrhages of that irregular nature in the posterior half of the hemisphere. What entity looks like that last image on the lower right? Amyloid is, uh, did you say that, Rich? Okay. Speed is also part of the equation here for, for scoring. Primary intracerebral hemorrhage then is primarily related to those top two, hypertension and cerebral angiopathy. I wouldn't call it primary if it's related to cocaine use or methamphetamine. I wouldn't call it primary if it's related to a coagulopathy. There may not be an underlying structural lesion, but there's a precipitating cause. And secondary is related to these underlying structural lesions that you see listed there. Now, moya moya is actually more common than I had imagined as I went through the literature review. Cerebral venous sinus thrombosis is another one. And, and even vasculitis is something to think about. So here's a, here's a couple examples. It's very, very round and well circumscribed, not really irregular. This app happens to be hemorrhage into a tumor. What do you think about the lower right? Now, they're very round, well circumscribed with surrounding edema. What else? Mets. This is a hemorrhage from multiple mets. What about the lower left? So this is a patient with a coagulopathy related to Coumadin. That fluid, fluid level, you think coagulopathy. And um, raise your hand if you can't figure out the one on the upper right. So that's, that's bleed from an arteriovenous malformation. It's low bar, and it's a young, non-hypertensive patient. So this is the most common cause of, of brain hemorrhage in a young, non-hypertensive patient with a low bar hemorrhage. That is the patient that you get an angiogram on every time. Why not just get a CTA? CTA is not sufficiently sensitive to really define AVMs well. 
And let's say you do an angiogram in a patient with a young young patient with an with a hemorrhage like that, and the CTA is negative. What do you do? Get a transfemoral angiogram. Let's say you do a CTA in a patient like that, and it suggests an AVM might be there. What do you do? Get an angiogram. The CTA doesn't change your treatment paradigm. You're going to get an angiogram if it's negative or positive. So in that patient, there's no reason to do an MRA or a CTA. You go right to diagnostic transfemoral angiogram to get sufficient resolution to see a small AVM or a small mycotic aneurysm that you might miss with the other techniques. A couple of words about amyloid. So there are three words aside from amyloid angiopathy. What are the other three words that are always associated? Uh, apple green birefringens. Lower right is the fluorescent view of a Congo red stain with this amyloid showing up on that prep as the yellowish greenish signal uh, on, on that. And on H uh, and E, you see a little reddish signal there. So this is a case of amyloid. The other thing that these patients have a disseminated disease of their brain blood vessels. So they often come in with a hemorrhage, but if you get a sensitive MRI like a GRE image on the top there, you'll see other small spots of previously asymptomatic hemorrhage. That's the profile of a patient with amyloid angiopathy. So they have a, a fundamental pathology involving their microvasculature. So in low bar hemorrhages, the angiogram is positive in about 30 or 40 percent of all cases and 65 percent of patients who are young and non-hypertensive. So the angiogram is done in a low bar hemorrhage. And even in old hypertensive patients, it's positive in 10 percent of the patients. So I, I would say if it's a low bar hemorrhage, you're going to get an angiogram. If it's in the basal ganglia or it's posterior fossa, if the patient has a history of hypertension in this series, in those locations, none of them had a positive angiogram. So that might be an area where we, you, you would carefully look at the MRI scan, maybe do a CTA or MR, MR, uh, MR angiogram to screen them, uh, particularly if it seems like there's some relationship to the sylvian fissure because an MCA aneurysm can rupture into the uh, hemisphere. If they're actively deteriorating and they need to be treated for, for progressing herniation, then you need to go to the operating room and carefully take the clot out. And if you find an AVM, try not to disturb it and make it bleed anymore, which you actually can do in, in many cases. Uh, blindly going ahead and trying to excise an AVM that you've not defined is quite challenging. And surprisingly enough, you can often go in, get enough of the clot out, decompress them, and they don't re-bleed immediately. And you can then buy time to get an angiogram and then decide what's going on and take them back if necessary at the appropriate. Just one other thing, intraventricular hemorrhage where it's only intraventricular or there's almost no brain parenchymal component, usually you need to do an angiogram in those patients. That's usually a, a visible vascular lesion. So here, here's the grid from the definitive paper. So if the patient uh, is uh, hypertensive in that series, none of them had a positive angiogram. And if they're over 45 in hypertensive, none of them had a positive angiogram. But if they were normotensive, no matter what their age, they had a significant number of positive angiograms. So if there's a questionable history about hypertension and they're elderly, you may not need to get it. If they're definitely hypertensive and they don't have a low bar hemorrhage, you don't need to get an angiogram. As you look at these, it's important to look carefully at the location of the hemorrhage. So the one on the right and the one on the left don't look all that different when you look at an axial image, but they're dramatically different. The one on the left does not go into the internal capsule or thalamus or brainstem. The one on the right involves the internal capsule and extends down into the midbrain. The one on the right is not a case where you're going to fix an irreversibly damaged brainstem. The one on the right can have a very reasonable uh, outcome. They're not going to be normal, but these patients often recover like a stroke patient. They have a hemiparesis, they walk with a limp, they have limited use of their hand, but they're independent, functional, they're happy to have that degree of recovery and so is their family. The other thing to appreciate here is that there are these, these, these two different kinds of clot. One is where you have some compression of key structures and there's possibility for recovery and the other is where there's frank involvement and damage to key structures. Now what about the question of the ischemic penumbra about a, around a hemorrhage? This has been 
this has been considered and thought as possibly as an indication for doing surgery. Remove the clot, reduce the pressure, restore the perfusion around the uh, area of hemorrhage, and potentially save neuronal function. And this, this, this concept was reinforced when xenon CTs and CT perfusion studies and spec scans were done, which measure blood flow around the hemorrhage. And, and you often find, look at the upper right in the there's blue all around the hemorrhage, and the blue is low perfusion. So does that mean that there's ischemia around the hemorrhage? This, this is the test that really is our current gold standard for answering that question. This is an oxygen PET study. And when you see low blood flow, it can be two things. It can be blood flow that is decreased because it's matched to decreased metabolism in the tissue because the tissue's been damaged or it's dysfunctional. That is not ischemia. Ischemia is a, is a mismatch between low blood flow and normal or metabolism so that there's inadequate blood flow. It requires a comparison between the level of blood flow and metabolism. If the metabolism is low, and the blood flow is low, it is proportionately and appropriately matched, and that's the, that's the metabolic equivalent of autoregulation. When, blood, when metabolism goes down, blood flow goes down. If the patient in barb coma, their blood flow goes down. When you're asleep, your blood flow goes down. When you have a seizure, your blood flow goes up. So metab blood flow follows metabolism, and if it's matched, there's no ischemia. It doesn't matter what the absolute level is unless it's profoundly low. So you measure ischemia by looking at the relationship between the, the uh, CMRO2, the oxygen level, and the blood flow. If the oxygen uptake level is low, it's hypometabolic, and you're going to have hypoperfusion, which is what you see in the lower left. This is the oxygen extraction fraction. When the blood flow is low and the metabolic demand is normal, how does the brain compensate? It extracts more oxygen out of each passing milliliter of blood, and you see a higher oxygen extraction fraction. It's got to be over 65 or 70 percent. Normal is 50 percent or below in order to be ischemic. Well, here you can see that there is no hot area in the oxygen extraction fraction. So if this was if this was ischemic around the hematoma, you see a hot area, red or yellow, around the hematoma, and it's it's not. And so these studies, this was done at Washington University. Marvin's done equivalent studies here in trauma patients with contusions where the same sort of question had prevailed, and his studies show the same thing that we see here, that rarely do you see ischemia around these lesions. It's matched blood flow. So operating to take the clot out in, to, in order to improve the perfusion, that doesn't make physiologic sense, and that probably is not the reason to think about it. But this may be a reason. Now, here, here's what you see over the course of time in these patients typically. And this is actually not one of the more dramatic cases. As the hematoma resolves and dissolves, you see that halo of low density on a CT scan expand. And the more of that you see, the worse the outcome ultimately in the patient. And Paul Vespa has demonstrated in some of his cases where he's done the, the thrombolytic therapy through a catheter to remove blood. He's shown that you see less edema than the, in this than, than you see here in the treated patients in whom you remove the blood clot. And, and other, other experiences have suggested that as well. So taking the clot out is one thing you can do to potentially reduce that neurotoxic effect of extravasated blood. You know, a mixture between extravasated blood and damaged brain is like hemlock to the brain. It is poisonous. And it damages neurons, and it causes edema, and it's associated with a worst outcome. Now, here, here's the issue of hematoma enlargement, which is surprisingly common. A, some degree of hematoma enlargement, if you do a scan within the first hour or so, occurs in more than half the patients. And it is substantial in a third of the patients. So a third of the patients potentially could be improved if you could do something to stop the enlargement, lower their blood pressure, give them a procoagulant, so those are the things that we'll talk about. Does the size of the hematoma make a difference? Well, it makes a big difference. What does that graph tell, tell you? I'll tell you what it tells me. If your hematoma is bigger than 30 cc's, and this is a study that uh, Tom Broad did in, in Cincinnati in the 90s. If your hematoma is bigger than 30 cc's, you don't have much of a chance of coming out of this with a minimal deficit. 
And if it's bigger than 60 cc's, you're probably going to die or be so disabled that you wish you were dead. So there is, now these, this is natural history. This is non-treated patients, most of them with deep cutaneal hemorrhage. 30 cc's is a cutoff for a severe hemorrhage. These little tiny spots of contrast enhancement here, and sometimes they're more obvious, are thought to represent active ongoing bleeding. That's contrast going into the clot. So the contrast has a higher density. So if you see that, that's, that is thought to be an actively bleeding hemorrhage that may require a different level of urgency and, and a more aggressive intervention. So that is the spot size sign. Here's another example of it, and here is the spot there. So when you see that, and this is the end result. So it went from this to this, presumably because that was bleeding. So that spot needs to be looked for on contrast enhanced scans. That's the, that is a reason for doing a contrast scan on these, some of these acute patients. And while you're doing it, you can, you, you can get the CT angiogram. So I don't object to a CT angiogram as a companion immediately to a, uh, a non-contrast CT. But uh, this is one of the things to look for. And the more dramatic that is, the worse the prognosis is for the patient. In fact, there's a grading scale for the spot sign, which, uh, which uh, you can read about. And the higher the grade, uh, the worse the outcome. So what about the concept of treating blood pressure to reduce hematoma growth. Uh, this trial is ongoing. The INTERACT trial is a trial primarily in Australia and the uh, Far East focused on reducing blood pressure to a target, a systolic pressure of 140, uh, as opposed to the standard uh, uh, traditional management uh, philosophy of just keeping the blood pressure no higher than 180. So they have looked at whether or not that reduces hematoma growth and whether or not it improves, uh, reduces uh, edema. And then this is the first trial that showed that in patients who had a lower blood pressure achieved, you can see on the, the right side of the image, that the increase in the hematoma was less in this group. However, if you take a careful look, look at the, the scale on the left, that is absolute hematoma decrease between treated and untreated, two, two mLs. That's not a lot in the patient that Patrick just showed us. In the more recent iteration of that trial, where they compared the group where they achieved the target of a systolic pressure of 140, this is the, the equivalent graph to the previous graph that shows what happens with edema. In the patients who had intensive therapy, the amount of edema was significantly less. This, I think, is from the pro prospective trial now. This is, uh, these are the patients treated with a target of 180. These are the patients treated with a target of 140. But again, the decrease is a few percentage points uh, and only a few milliliters. So there's some promise there. You know, the questions will arise, well, how, do, how, how does this work on a patient who's got a spot size or a spot size of increasing size and prominence? Uh, so there, 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 this is an active ongoing area of investigation, and it's intended at stopping the progression, which is a key goal early on. Now, the second way this has been approached is through the FAST trial. The FAST trial is factor seven for acute intracerebral hemorrhage. And factor seven is a procoagulant. Uh, recombinant factor seven is available commercially, and it's been administered to patients early on with intracerebral hemorrhage to see if that, uh, in comparison to a placebo group, if that reduces enlargement of the hematoma over time. And here is the outcome. Uh, and what they found was first, it does reduce the enlargement of the hematoma, but only by about two to four mLs on average. And second, the, the, the benefit to treatment, in other words, a slightly better survival at this point, goes away probably because this causes arterial events in atherosclerotic patients like myocardial infarction. So 
there's the, so the so the mi the uh, the arterial complication rate is twice as high you can see in the lower lower corner nine percent versus four percent. So the phase three trial was a great disappointment. After the phase two trial looked somewhat encouraging, this came out as I say in the New England Journal just a couple of years ago, I think in two thousand and eight, and it was run by Stephen Meyer, who's the neurocritical care specialist at Columbia. And they, they, he put 10 years of work into these studies and uh, really took a careful look at it and unfortunately really didn't give us a new weapon. What is the role in surgery for the treatment of intracerebral hemorrhage? It's really been quite unclear. Through the years, there have been a number of clinical trials and they've not come up with a definitive answer. And so uh, in 2005, the results of what is called the STICH, S-T-I-C-H trial, organized by David Mendelo in Scotland, uh, came out. And this was a multi-center trial with many patients studied, but it's important to understand how the study was constructed. This study consisted of that group of patients with a hemorrhage in whom the treating clinician did not think they absolutely had to have surgery or they absolutely should not have surgery. So they excluded patients with massive hemorrhages where they were in a coma because treatment was considered to be futile in those cases. And they, they excluded patients, uh, they excluded also patients with small hemorrhages where it was felt that surgery was not necessary. And they excluded a lot of patients, younger, non-hypertensive patients uh, who were actively deteriorating, who were taken emergently to surgery and felt not to be appropriate for randomization. So these turned out to be mostly patients with medium-sized basal ganglia hemorrhages and some lobar hemorrhages with a stable neuro, fixed neurological deficit. We're not, we're not deteriorating. So it's important to understand that this trial doesn't apply to many, many, many patients with an intracerebral hemorrhage. And it doesn't, the conclusions of this trial don't tell you what to do with all intracerebral hemorrhages. We'll come back to that. <clears throat> so the, the protocol was patients who were, you know, not in GCS uh, of three or four, they uh, had a clot that was at least two centimeters in size and they were not children. And here is the result. Surgery had no better result for mortality or morbidity or complications or neurologic outcomes. Surgery had no better outcome than medical therapy. Now this is the graph that is cited by people as saying, well, that means there's no indication for surgery in patients with a hemorrhage. Well, that, this applies only to that group where they were uncertain. It doesn't apply to a young, healthy patient who's actively herniating after coming in with just a headache with a low bar hemorrhage. That patient still needs to be rushed to the OR. And it doesn't apply at all to patients with cerebellar hemorrhages, which were excluded from this. So it doesn't say there's no role for surgery. It says in those patients, predominantly patients with a fixed neurologic deficit, predominantly in the basal ganglia, surgery didn't benefit the group in this trial. However, when you look at the subgroups, you find that surgery actually resulted in a worse outcome in patients with deep basal ganglia hemorrhages or with hemorrhages associated with intraventricular hemorrhage, and a better outcome, marginally better, in patients with low bar hemorrhage. So in, uh, for the low bar hemorrhages, the good outcome level was 50% almost as compared to 37%. So now, and this is on your pretest, what is STITCH2? It is an equivalent trial where they're randomizing patients with low bar hemorrhage to surgery or medical therapy. And again, these are those patients where there's uncertainty. Stable patients who are not actively deteriorating and patients that don't have such a massive hemorrhage that a good outcome is foregone, is precluded. Now a word about the timing. You might think if you're trying to prevent hematoma expansion and you're trying to uh, reduce the uh, toxic effect of the blood that you should go in immediately. It's a, it's a reasonable supposition. The experience, however, has been that to, all too often when you go in immediately, you're going in during the period of active bleeding, and it's difficult to identify the active bleeder and coagulate it and secure it. And so in this trial that came out of Houston, uh, I think in 2001 or so, they found that operating within the first six hours actually was associated with a worse outcome than operating later. One conclusion, and time will tell, might be that during the first six hours it's better to treat by controlling the blood pressure and possibly 
treating with some safe procoagulant to stop hematoma progression, and stabilize the patient is the way to go, and then operate later to get the blood out to prevent the toxic effects. So just some general guidelines about, in practice, what is reasonable to consider doing now? And these are not based on randomized trials, but these are based on bits and pieces of the trials and, and general clinical experience. So for a low bar hemorrhage, uh, possibly up to as big as 100 cc's, certainly as big as 60 cc's, with a deficit in a patient who's non-comatose or maybe even in a GCS of 7, if you wait to stabilize, it's reasonable to go ahead and do surgery. And in every case, you probably should get an angiogram. So that I think that's an, not an unreasonable paradigm for us to follow today. And obviously, if that 100 cc hemorrhage is in the dominant frontal lobe and has wiped out the language cortex, then that, that it has to be corrected for individual variation and location. For basal ganglia hemorrhage, when might, might it be reasonable? Well, in a, in a, in a somewhat smaller <coughs> hemorrhage, particularly 3.5 to 5 centimeters, in a patient with a de deficit who's actively deteriorating but who's not yet fully comatose it may, and, and doesn't have extension to the brain stem, it may be reasonable to attempt surgical evacuation in those cases. I've personally had patients who have recovered with an acceptable outcome who are just going right down the tubes from progressive herniation in that, in that circumstance. So a younger patient, a healthier patient who's actively deteriorating, but they're not yet wiped out, they're not yet deeply comatose, may be reasonable with a basal ganglion hemorrhage. And, and the general surgical approaches to the deep hemorrhages are these. Uh, the traditional approaches are through the middle frontal gyrus for more anteriorly located hemorrhages, and at the parietal occipital junction, maybe even a little farther back, for hemorrhages that are located in the posterior part of the uh, basal ganglia or the thalamus. And obviously, if they have a lobar hemorrhage, you go over the most superficial point of the lesion, but avoid eloquent cortex. And more recently, as Patrick referred to, we've been using an eyebrow approach and a frontal burr hole for endoscopic evacuation. I'll talk about that in just a minute. And here for the, here's a, a reasonable approach for a posterior ganglionic hemorrhage, subcortical hemorrhage. And obviously, low bar hemorrhages you go in right over, right over the uh, clot. And this is this is what you see again with what amyloid angiopathy, that kind of a pattern. So if we if if this is the groundwork for trials that are going on now, if hematoma evacuation is beneficial leaves mass effect, prevents herniation, and removes toxins. But the, but the surgical trauma of a craniotomy and a big incision in the brain may, be, may, may negate the benefits of getting the hematoma out, then maybe minimally invasive techniques are the way to go. And this is what is being pursued now. But it is, when I say now, it's, it's based on preliminary work that's been done in the past. So who, who's the pioneer of endoscopic evacuation of intracerebral hemorrhage? Well, we'll see in just a minute. It's not those two guys. It's this guy. Ludwig Auer from uh, Graz in 1989 published a big series, 100 patients randomized to surgery or medical therapy with either uh, subcortical lobar or basal ganglia hemorrhage, operated on in the first 48 hours. And this is what he found. Surgical, the mortality was dramatically less in the endoscopically treated patients. He had a six millimeter endoscope sheath, he put it in, he suctioned, he put the endoscope in and coagulated bleeding spots with a, with a laser, a YAG laser, and uh, this is, this, these were his results. He also used image guidance, but he used image guidance using ultrasound. And uh, he found that he had good neurologic outcome in more patients who were operated. Uh, and it primarily applied to the patients with the lobar hemorrhages the same way that is coming out of the STITCH trial. Although there were some decent recoveries in the putaminal hemorrhage group, and the mortality rate was certainly less with endoscopy. Didn't, didn't make too much difference what you did with the patients in the hemorrhages because they are in a bad group. And so here the, here's where the good outcomes occurred with endoscopic. Younger patients, hematomas less than 50 cc's, Patients who were not deeply stuporous, uh, 
and subcortical hemorrhages. So the younger hemorrhage patient with a cortical lesion or lobar lesion is the one where, where evacuation seems to be more effective. And, and, and in this case, endoscopic evacuation has been more effective. Now, many of you, uh, and, and Patrick referred to this, uh, are familiar with the trial that's going on here now at UCLA and also simultaneously at uh, Mass General and Case Western Reserve. Uh, and they're coming up uh, at uh, the Barrow Neurologic Institute to look at endoscopic evacuation of intracerebral hemorrhage. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that trial because we're doing this here now. And the thought here is that maybe if you get the clot out, but don't damage the brain with a major operation. You can, you can uh, promote some uh, improved recovery in these patients. And we're using, we're using uh, the, the endoscope that John Frizee has developed. Uh, it has a 8 millimeter sheath, bigger than the one that Auer used. And the technique that we're using now within the trial really is purely stereotactic. We just go into the deep part of the hematoma and suction. We don't look around. We come out to the superficial part of the hematoma suction and then we irrigate and use the endoscope to see what the irrigation looks like. And if we see an active bleeder, then we use the endoscope and, a, and an endoscopic bipolar to control the bleeder. And so here's the setup. Image guidance is key because you're, you're, you're navigating purely by image guidance. Uh, it helps to have the robotic uh, metaca arm, the hydraulic metaca arm to stabilize the scope, which we use. And here's a case. Basal ganglia hemorrhage in a 35-year-old guy who was hypertensive. 37 cc's, he was plegic on the other side. We went in through the eyebrow with a burr hole, and here's the target. There's the deep location for suctioning, and then uh, we suction. We have calculated the volume of the clot by the ABC divided by two method. That is, you take the dimensions in all three uh, uh, directions and divide by two, and that gives you a pretty accurate estimate of the clot volume. And then we suction until we get just about that volume out. <clears throat> We're now doing this with a, uh, a suction regulator at the wall and starting at 50 tor, then going to 100 and 150. And I can tell you, it, it, the clot doesn't come out at 50. A few of them come out at 100. They almost all come out at 150. And you don't have to go to wall suction, which is 300. So the regulator reduces the suction, the barrel trauma, if you use that. Now here's the second suction point on a, at a more superficial level. And here's what it looks like in the OR. So if you look at the image guidance screen behind my head, you're going to see the yellow marker for the endoscope going in. And if you look in the lower right-hand corner, of your lower left, you'll see us steering the sheet with a trocar into the hemorrhage, guided by looking at the screen, flying by the instrument there. Patient and the robotic arm holds it there. The hydraulic arm holds it. So suction is applied. I just use finger occlusion of the open end, and that transmits the suction to the hematoma, and you can see it coming out. And then we just measure how much comes out. It usually takes one or two applications of your thumb. Sometimes you have to oscillate it a couple of times to shake up the clot and, 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 and agitate it and get it to come out, and then measure it. And so usually one or two suctions at the first location, you'll get that's all you'll get out. It's often two-thirds of the clot. You back out the endoscope and do the same thing at the superficial location, and then leave it there, start irrigating, and put the endoscope in to see what's coming out and make sure there's no bright red bleeding or massive, massive bleeding. And often it takes a half an hour's worth of irrigation to get the blood to stop. And we use as a procoagulant what the cardiac surgeons use in the operating room, DDAVP, and that seems to help the, the, the cavity dry up over time. And so what, you, what you're looking at with the endoscope really is not the clot and, and steering the suction around. That is a, here is a monopolar suction used to coagulate an oozing vein. There is a bipolar that goes in as well. But you're really just looking for the bleeding. And then uh, in many cases we do an intraoperative CT, and here's that case. So this is suctioning twice and then just coming out. The whole thing takes an hour. Uh, it's done through a burr hole. And uh, uh, it is, it, it, when it works like that, boy, it is, it is a very elegant operation. And that big halo of damaged tissue from the uh, toxicity of the blood seems to be ameliorated by that evacuation. 
And you can see this is where the track to the brain was. The, the introduction of the endoscope doesn't really damage the brain extensively. You do see that on the delayed flare image. You can see actually exactly where it was because in this case, you left the catheter in the cavity. And so there's not a big, there's a little halo of high signal on the flare, but not much around it. And you're going through relatively non open cortex there. And just one, another example of, of a much bigger hemorrhage. This is one of those 60 plus cc hemorrhages where you can be sure the patient's going to be devastated or dead based on the natural history. And that was the final result. We don't always get all the clot out. But you know, it made me think as I was looking at this strategy to reduce blood pressure, if they're, they're happy with a reduction in volume of the clot ultimately of two to four milliliters, here we probably got out 50 milliliters of blood. So we turned, we turned a big clot that was over 60 to one that is about 15 cc's. And that guy has recovered and he's got an aphasia that's moderate, but he communicates with his family well and he's independent and uh, happy to be uh, around. The low bar hemorrhage is often works very well. So there's a, there's a low bar hemorrhage in a patient who, who had a severe hemiparesis from compression of primary motor cortex, and within a day, they were left with very little motor deficit whatsoever. And that's the craniotomy, size of the nickel. Another example of a basal ganglia hemorrhage. And, and what you see that I didn't used to see with surgical evacuation of clots like this, I often would, would, would do those clots, and then the postoperative MRI, the CT or MRI scan would be very disappointing because the shift didn't go away. You'd almost replace the mass effect of the hemorrhage with the mass effect of all the edema from working through the brain. With these, you, the, the brain springs back when you apply the suction, and the shift is dramatically improved on the post-op scan or even the intraoperative scan within 30 minutes almost right away. This one's 4 to 24 hours, but very often you see that kind of expansion of the ipsilateral ventricle and resolution of the shift right away. The suction sucks it back into place, I guess. And then even for these complex amyloid cases, which we have treated, the suction point number one is here, then you back the endoscope out, park it here, and it can be quite effective. And doing a big open operation in these patients with these fragile vessels is, is fraught with a risk of recurrent bleeding. <coughs> uh, we have had two cases now who have had bleeding extension after the endoscopic procedure. Now, both of these were earlier in our experience when we were steering the endoscope around and visually suctioning blood out rather than just putting it into two locations and suctioning, which I think is really the most minimally invasive approach. And I am... Uh, completely gotten away from this visually guided uh, tactic because both of those patients did very poorly. Now we reported our early experience in surgical neurology. We had a substantial hematoma reduction. We had one patient die, the one I just showed you. Uh, the same one was the one who had a post-op re-bleed and it had a dramatic difference, but this was in a very small number of cases. Currently, there's an ongoing trial in conjunction with Hopkins who is doing what's called the MISTI trial, and we'll talk about that in a second as I finish. Uh, and we're doing this trial in conjunction with them uh, at, at several centers around the country. Case Western just did another case earlier this week, and we'll be uh, we'll be seeing how uh, this stands up uh, against a, a medical control group and against uh, the other minimally invasive technique that we're going to talk about. Now, who else is doing things like this? Well, Duryong Chang uh, from uh, Taiwan is doing this in Taipei. He's using an 8-millimeter sheath, but he's steering it visually with an endoscope down it and just putting a suction through it. They're doing it through a burr hole, and they're getting better evacuation than they do with stereotactic aspiration with TPA. We'll talk about that, or with craniotomy, and they're getting good results. I want to finish by talking about the MISTI trial, which is, which is described here. This is built off the, the groundwork laid by Mario Zuccarella, who's now the chair at University of Cincinnati. Uh, and Mario spent the last couple of decades working on surgical treatment of intracerebral hemorrhage, first in an animal model and then clinically. And he is uh, he's directing the uh, surgical component of this. Dan Hanley, the intensivist at Hopkins, is the uh, medical co-PI. And this is this is being uh, tried at uh, 10 or 20 centers around the U.S. now, and I think some international centers as well. <clears throat> 
this involves the same kind of procedure that Paul Vespa has been doing, which is catheter introduction into the hematoma using stereotaxis and then dissolving the clot with TPA and allowing it to suction out with multiple TPA infusions a couple of days for several days. <clears throat> Paul has independently reported his results with favorable with a favorable pilot study. So he puts a catheter in, aspirates what will come out of a ventric, which sometimes is 10 or 20 cc's, and then uh, confirms its location and puts TPA in to dissolve and aspirate or evacuate the clot. And this is really what's done in the MISTI trial. So there are several, I guess it's three infusions of TPA a day for the first 72 hours, and serial scans and exams are done sequentially after that. So they're using 0.3 milligrams of TPA through the catheter, letting it sit for an hour, dissolve things, and then letting the blood run out. And it can be quite effective. So here's, here's a clot after inserting the catheter and 48 hours later, so probably five or six TPA infusions later. So one question we're addressing with a comparison of the uh, ICES trial we're doing here and this trial is, does it make a difference whether you get the blood out right away, which you do with this immediate endoscopic suctioning, or whether it comes out slowly over 48 to 72 hours, and, uh, and and that is one of the one of the points of comparison. But this is what they have found uh, in this trial. First, a stability scan. We're only st we're only treating patients who have a stable clot. We're not paying, treating patients with an actively involving clot because that's another variable introduced into the trial. So we're treating patients with scans six six hours apart that show no further enlargement. And we're treating the patients within 48 hours surgically or 72 hours with the TPA. And this is what happens uh, to the clot as the TPA is infused. So uh, this is a percentage reduction. At two days afterwards, about 50% of the clot is out using that technique. So it does remove the clot. The rebleeding rate, you might be concerned about giving TPA into a hematoma cavity. The rebleeding rate has been very low. The infection rate has been almost nil, and other complications have been quite low. So you can do it. You can get the clot out, and uh, it's going to be moving on to a phase three trial over the next couple of years, as we hope the endoscopic technique that we're pursuing here at UCLA will as well. So so I hope I've answered the questions on the pretest through the course of the, the uh, talk here. Uh, and uh, I hope you've gotten a good background into the concepts of intracerebral hemorrhage and, and, and also an update on some of the important ongoing approaches to new therapy for intracerebral hemorrhage. I'd be happy to answer any questions, and thanks for coming and your attention. We give, the, the cardiac surgeons use 0.3 micrograms per kilogram of DDAVP when they have intraoperative bleeding, and um, we use and it's given systemically and intravenously. Could it could it be used through the catheter into the cavity? I don't know. It's a thought, but we haven't studied its effect on the tissue directly. And I, my my subjective sense is it does gradually slow down the clot. What what may work really great for that application is factor seven, because we talked about this in our recent conference where we had a case with a patient with an intracerebral hemorrhage who was in florid liver failure at a very elevated INR with a severe coagulopathy. And we evacuated the clot and the cavity immediately filled with fresh blood until we get factor seven and the bleeding really stopped within 10 minutes. So in that one case, I saw the potential of factor seven and it may be a reasonable salvage technique when you run into severe arterial bleeding and maybe in the right dose, it, it will be a good adjunct to this as well. I mean, the ideal treatment in the future is going to be something to stop that progression of the hematoma, stabilize the situation, and then minimally invasively and safely get the, get the clot out to reduce the progressive toxic effect down the line. Okay, thank you.